So today's cardinal lesson, we're going to school you a bit on the House and Senate appropriations bill that kept the government from shutting down. And what was attached to that was a thing called Secure Act 2.0. And the Secure Act, if you'll recall, in 2019 had big changes for retirement plans and IRAs, Roth IRAs, inheritances, a whole list of stuff. And so this thing, which is called Secure Act 2.0, has been around in the background for about a year. And it's really the cleanup bill for all the stuff that they maybe should have done in two, you know, in, in the original Secure Act, but they didn't, or ramifications that they didn't intend. And so they've had this thing just kind of lurking, and it's had and has bipartisan support. And so I'm thinking they just tacked this thing on there to have something in the beginning that they agreed with because they had to come together with something to avoid a government shutdown. So all the politics, we don't get into politics on this show. We just want to know what is, and then we want to tell you what we think you ought to do about it, okay? And that's that's where we are. So today, we're not going to school you on everything in the Secure Act 2.0, because we'd need about four or five boards to go over all the things that they did. There's things that affect workers. There's all kinds of things that I don't really feel are central to people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, who are our clients, who's you, and you've already got your money in your IRA or a significant part of it, and you're anticipating retirement or you're already in retirement, and now we have a little bit different problem. We've got to start getting money out of the IRA to live on, and we got to pay taxes on it, and we want to prevent that from becoming where we just keep kicking the can down the road, and then we pass away, and we haven't taken much out of there, and we've got this big untaxed balance that goes to the next generation. It's called a tax bomb. And so our priorities as financial planners working in the retirement planning with people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, which is you, what I've done and we've done, Tom and I have done, is we've pulled out out of this Secure Act 2.0, because this is the law now. These are the regulations. And so we're going to need to abide by them. Some of them don't start for a few years, and we have that noted in here. But we've picked out five things that we want to call your attention to, and we want to explain them. And I'd really like to bring Tom on and show you the show notes before I get into the five things. Yeah. And so we have... We're doing these in these videos now where we have show notes in the link below the video. You can find them on our website as well. Um, but it goes through, there's a picture of the board with so some people like to print it out. They can look at it more clearly, uh, take notes. But the, also there's a little more details below in the show notes. And so we have the picture of the board. The next part are just really from Ed Slot is some of the, a little more details of these things that we have on the, the board here, but it goes into a little more detail. So look at that. This by no means is everything that's in this Secure Act 2.0. There's a lot more stuff that's not covered in here, but this is, gives you just sort of a highlight of, of what we're uh, talking about today. Okay, so let, let's jump right in. These are the key changes that we think affect you, and they've affected us and how we're going to put these in the plan. So I'm going to give you an explanation of them, hopefully a short one, and then we're going to jump to, like, what should you do about it? How should you act differently than you would have if this hadn't changed? So let's talk about the first one is in 2022, as a result of the first SECURE Act, you have to start required minimum distributions, RMDs, at 72. So you, you could take nothing out of your IRA or 401k or qualified pre-tax money for your whole life until you get to be 72. Retired or not, you have to start taking distributions. They have now changed 72, starting in 2023, to 73. So they've moved it one year out. Before 2020, 
it was 70 and a half. And they, this first Secure Act moved it from 70 and a half to 72. Secure Act 2.0 moves it from 72 to 73. Now you notice, rather than explain this thing that happens in 10 years in 2033, this smells of a budget compromise where they said, okay, so we're going to move it to 75, but we're not going to do it for 10 years, which gets really confusing. And so I, I went into all the application and I just picked the year of birth. So I'm going to give you a simple way to understand this. We can go back later, get into a more detailed explanation. If you were born 1951 through 1959, your required minimum distribution start date is age 73. The year you turn 73, that's when you start minimum distributions. If you were born in 1960 or after, or you're younger than that, your required RRMD is 75. That's a simple way to understand it. There would be some caveats. So we're not getting into details much today is the RMD age has moved basically one year from 72 to 73. And what I have to say about that, and I want to hear what Tom has to say as well, is as soon as they have a law like this, required, which means the IRS is making me do it, the government, required minimum, so they're telling me the, the least amount that I have to take out of there, distribution distribution that's take out of there. So what I don't like about that is that is a way of telling people, people retweeted from the alliance, I'm not going to take anything out until I'm 73. Now, I used to have to do 72. This is good. Well, in the one sense it is because you're going to save the taxes that you would have by taking it out earlier. But with most people, I mean, most people that we're talking with and we're doing financial planning, they got to start taking some money out of their IRA or 401k once they retire because they need some sort of income to live on, okay, in addition to their Social Security and what other savings they have. But then there are others who they don't need that money because they just get by on their Social Security, their other savings, maybe they're working part-time, uh, they have everything paid for. There's a lot of people that just, they don't tap this thing ever until they have to. And then furthermore, they, um, when they do have to tap it, which is now age 73, they're just going to take the minimum. And what that creates is what I was talking about earlier, the tax bomb, where this thing keeps growing and growing and growing. So I want to hear what Tom has to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right is, you know, at some level, some people will view this initially as a good thing. And, and we'll get into a second where it can be very helpful for our clients but I think a problem is people will get stuck into this idea of I'm not going to touch it until I have to. And so this delays it potentially up to two years further, depending on when you were born, than what it would have been. And now that's two years more that you're not taking distributions. You know, just by definition, you're two years closer to whenever you're going to pass away, whatever date that is. And there's going to be more money left in that account that's going to go to the beneficiaries that now have... Uh, this tax bomb, something that they're going to have to pay a lot of taxes on. And so where it can be helpful is if we're working with clients and we're on a strategy already to withdraw down these traditional IRAs or 401ks, specifically using Roth conversions or strategies like that, this gives them more time to do that. Because one of the things with Roth conversions is you can't convert an RMD, a required minimum distribution cannot be converted to a Roth account. So this, if you're doing this, if you're already on a strategy to draw down these accounts, this gives you more time to do that, which is helpful. But that's with the caveat that you're on a strategy like that. If you're not, this could be problematic that people just end up not taking money out when they really should be. Yeah. Okay. Next thing, QCDs. A lot of folks that we run into still don't know what QCDs are, and it could be because they're much less than 70 or they're even approaching 70 and they just, they wouldn't have any reason to really know because you can't do a QCD until you're 70 and a half. Okay. And then you can do one every year after that. And what a QCD is, it stands for qualified charitable distribution. And so you're able to take money out of your IRA and you're able to donate it to a qualified charity. 
directly and it doesn't show up as income to you. So you don't have to pay income taxes on the money coming out of the IRA and it goes to the charity and the charity doesn't have to pay taxes either. So the money is never taxed. And these have been around for a few years, namely about 10. Um, they've been improved, changed, that kind of thing. But there's a whole bunch of rules that go with that. And I don't really want to get into those today. We have other videos on QCDs. But even if people aren't 70 and a half, when we're doing financial planning, creating a retirement plan and a tax plan, we might plan to leave a certain amount of money in the traditional IRA or just so that, that they haven't paid taxes on, just so they can begin donating 70 and a half and after through the use of a QCD. And so it works out very tax smart. It also enables people that are charitably inclined to give more or to get a better tax benefit for their giving. Um, now, there is a limit of $100,000 a year per IRA or per person, you know, per IRA. I mean, you can't, you can't have several IRAs and give $100,000 out of each. This isn't a problem for most people. I mean, most people that are doing QCDs with us are doing 5,000, 10,000. You know, we've had them as high as 40, 50, 60. But um, in any case, you can give 100,000 avoid the taxes and they count as your RMDs or your required minimum distribution. So this is a, is a nice strategy for somebody that's charitably inclined. And what they've just changed is they're going to take the hundred thousand dollars per person per year, and they're going to index it for inflation. And they're going to do that starting in 2024. So that number is going to go up. Now there is also this new provision we're definitely not going to go there today um, where you can one time from your IRA contribute or put in $50,000 from your IRA into a charitable gift annuity, a charitable remainder unit trust, or a charitable remainder annuity trust. So they've put a provision in there that you can now do that, but definitely don't try to do that without getting professional help because you know, that is like any QCD is, is that the, the devil's in the details. Okay. So the next thing is this is where we're going to start talking in circles. If we're not careful here is Roths have been around since 1997, you know, the Roth IRA, and then it's expanded and it's expanded. And Ed Slot calls this the Rothification of the retirement system or just, and it's just, they've gotten better and better for consumers or for taxpayers to get their money into a Roth. And so they weren't available in the beginning inside of a 401k plan or a 403b plan or some other retirement plan. They, there was no such thing as a Roth 401k in the beginning. And then somewhere in the 10, 15 years ago, they made a provision to allow them. And then there was a good period of time that plans didn't offer them. I mean, just, so they were legal, but your 401k didn't choose to offer them. And there's still plans that don't offer a 401, I mean, excuse me, a Roth 401k option. But now there's that ability. And we found that a lot of clients are not taking advantage of that. Anyhow, even when it's there. So, Tom, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is you're absolutely right that over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years, more and more employers have started adding the Roth option available inside the 401ks to this point where most of them have it. It's not every company, but most have it now, but it's still very underutilized. A lot of people one, couldn't even tell you the difference between a Roth and a traditional. And even if they knew the difference, I've run into several people recently that didn't even know. I asked them, is it available? They told me no. I had them go check. It was. I mean, a lot of people just don't know it. But if it is available, I think you should definitely consider utilizing it. Because especially for people who might be 
earning, or maybe you're a couple earning above the limits that allow you to put money into a Roth IRA, this is a way that you can start saving money into Roth accounts that earn their earnings are tax free um, over the years. And all the distributions are tax free when you pull them out, especially right now with tax rates being so low, it's a great way to save, have some money saved for retirement. And okay. so, so what we're talking about the change here in number three here is about the Roth option inside of workplace plans. Okay. And that's been around for a while in most of them. A lot of people not taking advantage of it. We leave people, even after initial meetings, a lot of them, where they're considering Roth conversions. And we'll leave them and say, if you got work in another year or two or three, let's take a look at your 401k and let's start contributing into the Roth side. Um, right away from that. So you can build up some balance between now and retirement. We've left a lot of people that have done that. So what's changed is with a work pace plan and you're still working and you're up past this RMD age, which used to be 72, it's now going to be 73. If you're still working, you don't have to take required minimum distributions out of your 401k. If you also have an IRA, you got to take minimum distributions out of that. But if you're in, participating in a work-based plan, you're over 72 or now 73, you don't have to take minimum distributions. But then if you retire and you leave your money in your 401k, but you're now retired, you've, you have to take minimum distributions out of your 401k, just like you do an IRA. And you also have to take Roth minimum distributions. So if you have a Roth 401k not working, you've had to take minimum distributions. They're getting rid of that in 2024. So beginning in 2024, if you have money in the Roth, no minimum distributions. And frankly, a lot of people move their money out of the 401k into an IRA anyhow, when they retire, we help people do that all the time. So this isn't that huge of a deal, but it's, it's a change in the law. Yeah. yeah. And I think just to speak on that is it's not that common, but I think they're just sort of filling a hole here is they saw a gap where you don't have to do it the RMD out of the IRAs. You did have to do it out of the 401k. They're sort of just filling in where, okay, it's Roth. You don't have to take it. So I think it's a good change. I don't think it impacts a ton of people, but if it does impact you, it's, it's going to be nice to not have to worry about it. Sure. Now, on you, you couldn't have a Roth inside of a SEP, a, a simplified employee pension, which is really an IRA, but you couldn't have a Roth option. And starting in 2023, you can now. Same thing with a simple IRA. So those are plans and they're workplace plans. And they didn't used to have a Roth option. Now they're going to be have a Roth option. It's kind of that simple. Um, the last one is really affects a lot of employers because now if you participated in a Roth 401k or a 403, Roth 403b or a Roth anything in a workplace plan, you and then you get matching contributions from your employer, which most do, those matching contributions had to be on the traditional side with before tax money. So the employer could write it off essentially. And so now they've made a provision that employers can do the match on the Roth side, providing there's Roth money going in on your side. If you're the employee, the employer can now do a Roth match, but that's going to be you notice it says can allow. It doesn't mean that your employer has to do that is the plan. They're going to need to update their plan to allow for that. But the tax code is now allowing of that. And so that's actually pretty cool. Um, you know, that's a benefit that we're going to enjoy. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll see how many employers adopt this as an option. Um, I think we'll be slow initially because they they view their contributions into the 401k and rightly so is a tax. They get to deduct that from the, the company side of things. 
going into the Roth, they won't be able to. I mean, we'll just see how many do it. But if, if your company does allow for it, that's a great option for employees to more uh, reason to contribute to the Roth. And then we did miss one spot on the board, the one right above that on the 50 plus contributions. And so this one is is going to be important for these high earners, people who are earning a high income. And we, you know, call us if we can define that if, if you're interested. But if you're maxing out your 401k and you're over 50, there's a catch up contribution that allows you to put more into it if you're uh, over 50. This new law starting in 2024 is those catch up contributions, that additional money has to go into the Roth 401k. And so if you're used to taking, you know, next year for people over 50, 2023, the max would be 30,000, 7,500 of that is the catch up contribution. That 7,500 will have to go to the Roth. So you won't get the tax deduction on that 7,500. Now it will be building up the Roth, which I think is actually probably beneficial, but that that is a change from the before the secure 2.0. Okay. So a number of cleanup Roth changes in part of the Rothification of retirement plans in the workplace. Now, number four, this isn't going to affect you unless you've put money in a 529 plan for your kids or grandkids, and then they've gone to college and they didn't use it all. And so there's leftover money in the 529 plan. Part of it is, you know, taxable, but you've already paid the taxes on it. Part of it is earnings that haven't paid any taxes on. And there's all kinds of options, but a lot of people just end up pulling that out eventually, and they're going to have to pay taxes on the earnings. So now there's a new option. And that option is if you have leftover money, the beneficiary can roll that into a Roth IRA and they can roll it in up each year up to the Roth IRA maximums, which is like 7,500 bucks, I think. That's for somebody over 50. So it's 6,500 for people um, under 50. And they can do it up to a maximum of $35,000 over their lifetime. So this is a nice benefit for the people in that situation where you can get some of the young people that have finished college and they're out there working. They don't really have enough spendable money to stick in a Roth IRA. You, you can do this essentially out of the, out of the uh, 529 plan, the unused portion. Um, last one, number five, uh, we're gonna talk about the missed RMD penalty. Most people have no idea what we're talking about here, but the penalty has been the whole time I've been practicing. If you missed RMDs, and where we run into this is somebody that's older, they're past RMD age, and they just, you know, were managing their own money and they just didn't do it. And now the kids are coming in and they're realizing this, or they're bringing us in and we're kind of looking through the stuff and they haven't taken RMDs ever. And um, this is a problem, okay? And so there's a, there's a way to fix it, but it involves paying all the taxes and you gotta file something. The penalty has been 50% of the taxes due. So that means you're gonna pay 150% of the taxes due for all those years. Um, and then you, you know, you're gonna actually take the RMD all out now. So that's gonna bunch it up in a year. It's not pretty, just the taxes are not pretty but then you add 50% to that. This new bill has lowered the 50% to 25%. So it's cut it in half. That's helpful. It's 25 is still pretty penal. And there is an appeal procedure to try to make it go away. And the success of that is, um, I don't want to get into that today, but it just, there, there, there's a way to make this thing go away if you appeal to the IRS. Um, and that's going to cost you some money to do that. But anyhow, 50 to 25%. And they've also added that it gets reduced to 10% if you file the corrections in a timely manner. So um, that's a cleanup provision, definitely, to make a, I think, overly penal tax, um, tax penalty uh, more favorable for the taxpayer. 
So, um, I mean, this is, we're just trying to get something out quick of how this affects you and really how it affects the people that we're generally helping. And we're continuing to study this stuff. And a lot of our peers are as well and reading about it. But nothing, it doesn't really call for you to do anything right away, maybe other than if you're just turning 72 next, this year in 2023, maybe you know, you're going to see that as good news. You don't have to do an RMD. So the, there isn't anything real earth shattering that you have to do from this, but it does have a pretty big effect on your overall planning which I would like to see more people doing that is sitting down, looking at the bulk of their money that they have in their retirement savings account, see how much of it they've paid taxes on, which would be Roth money, and then how much they've not paid taxes on and get a plan over their lifetime to really reduce the tax bill on that for them, their surviving spouse, and then ultimately their kids and grandkids who will be the heirs of this thing. So, now, I want to go over, you know, what areas are the seven worries that we're talking about today? Is it this whole show has been on IRAs and 401ks and plans? It's been talking about retirement income because an RMD is retirement income or the D portion of that distribution. That's how a lot of people live in retirement with that and their Social Security. This has an estate planning effect. Um, and we're always talking about estate planning because that's really what the whole SECURE Act has been about, is getting the taxes paid on the IRAs. And then it's obviously about income taxes. So I'm Hans Scheil, and I thank you for listening. Thank you.